record. Welcome. This is the 7th of September, 2022. It's Git Cache Maintenance. Let's get started. Okay, so Rushikesh, which, which topics are most urgent on your mind, which are most of concern for you? I've got, oh. I've got two, I'll offer two that I can. One is I think Git Client Plugin is very close to ready to release, but I wanted to, to check that with you. And then the other was more about Git Plugin and I, I've got some topics there I wanna be sure we discuss. Okay. Uh, uh, regarding the merge uh, of, you know, the Git client plugin code, I was thinking of, uh, uh, like, you know, let's discuss about the prefetch command once again. So yesterday I was working on the prefetch command and then we've discussed right about, uh, uh, you know, something related to the process being attached to a terminal. So I was thinking uh, in that case, if we directly run the git maintenance prefetch command, I think that would also fail in uh, directly rather than calling a git ls remote is what I am thinking. Right. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't need to run a uh, ls remote is what I am feeling. Directly when we run the git maintenance, uh, you know, the prefetch command, I think it would fail automatically and it would skip on, uh, skip and move on to the next cache. I like that. That's very simple. It's it's probably no no higher cost to attempt to get prefetch and have it fail than to try to do a get ls remote because actually it may be more expensive to do get ls remote because in order to do get ls remote we have to ask questions about what is the what is the remote origin etc. So yeah, okay, I like that. Because when we tried it before, we were waiting for, you know, waiting to enter the SSH password, right? But uh, mm -hmm. that would be happening only when we run the MVN HPI command. So uh, if it would be like, a, you know, a Jenkins instance, which is already uh, running without this command, I think it would fail. So, right. So uh, when Git tries to establish a connection for prefetch for an authenticated repository, it won't uh, it won't ask for the credentials, right? It, uh, at the terminal or at the shell, at the shell, it won't stop the execution of the program, right? Well, okay. So so for precision, what Rushikesh discovered was while running in a debug or a development environment. So running Jenkins or Java minus jar Jenkins.war from a command line or running Maven HPI colon run. In that case, if it's doing an SSH connection, it will mm. actually stop and prompt. And, and oh, that's okay. unfortunate, but that's the, that's the nature of the SSH that's being used there. It's, it's command like it calls SSH, SSH looks at the terminal configuration, says, ah, oh, I could ask the user a question. I better do that. And, mm -hmm. and so there is a setting that will, that can be used to switch off that capability to, to tell, to tell a command or to tell SSH do not prompt, no but prompt, yeah. that's not the default because I've been scared to make that the default because who knows which, command line git or which mm. git user in Jenkins has some strange dependency on exactly that behavior. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Mm. Okay. So, so Rushikesh, it sounds like you're okay with, with, I like the idea of let's just do the prefetch. And I assume we want to catch any exception and turn the exception into a simple a simple single line message that says, hey, prefetch, prefetch, or exception and prefetch ignored. We certainly don't want to log the entire exception because then we're going to waste an awful lot of logging with huge backtraces on exceptions. Okay. Good, that, that sounds good to me. So winding back one step to the Git client plugin, are you okay if I mark that one as move it out of draft and declare that it's ready for review? 
Oh, yesterday I added, uh, uh, you know, a get LS remote. So I'll have to remove that. Uh, so once okay. I remove that, I think it would, uh, you know, it would be there. Uh, yeah, then I would uh, remove it as a from, you know, a draft PR. Oh, okay, great. That's fine. So you'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, great. And uh, you had some concerns regarding the Git plugin? Oh, oh yes. So my, my concerns on the Git plugin, several of them, I've pushed the changes myself without, without even asking your permission. I just, I just went ahead and did it. But others, I'm going to have to go learn from other people how to do it. So you had included an explicit dependency on, on Xtreme. Yeah. And what that did was that caused other transitive dependencies to be included. And the Git plugin is somewhat special in that we like to keep its dependencies as small as possible because other consumers treat the Git plugin, the whole plugin as an API. And if I make the mistake, if we make the mistake of including some other API in it, they will start relying on it to be there because it's, okay. it's there in so many Jenkins installations. The Xtreme interface, as far as I understand it, is already available from Jenkins core. So we don't have to include the Xtreme, Xtreme jar file. Okay. So I deleted the Xtreme dependency, compiled, and confirmed that it compiles just fine. And I'm, I'm actually running it, or will be running it shortly here. Oh, so, uh, so things are working as expected? Yes. Yeah. So, and that, and that's what I expected because Xtreme is used so widely in Jenkins that it has to exist already in, probably exists in many places. It certainly exists in core. Okay. Oh, I didn't know about that because what I was doing was I was reading the documentation and I didn't find any way of, you know, using Xtreme. So what I did was I just adding the dependency into the form file. Well, and, and I think that's, that was very resourceful of you. Well done. That, that was exactly, and, and you're, you're in an area where I'm particularly weak, so I'm going to go ask some experts, hey, how should, how should this be done so that we can, we can get, it, get it to the point where something that's as widely used as the Git plugin does things similarly to other parts of Jenkins? Yeah. Okay, so that was, that was one. Then the other was, I had seen that you had reordered some imports and I, I just took the, the initiative and put them back. The reason I don't, I don't make white space based changes like that is because there are, I, there is, there are right now 20 pull requests pending for the Git plugin. And in addition, there are probably another 30 or 40 that are not open but were proposed and, and closed because we couldn't review them. Every time I change white space, I risk breaking one of those other, uh, other pull requests. So all I did was, and, and it, it, did no, it did no change to compilation. It did no harm to anything. All I did was put it back. Okay. Are you okay with that? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with uh, like, like uh, did you change the like imports? I like I didn't get you exactly what. what yeah, that. so so what had happened was, in abstract Git SCM source, mm -hmm. there was a block at the top where there was a a few there were a few Jenkins imports and then a big chunk of Java imports and then another set of Jenkins imports. And you, you did the logical thing. You said, look, Jenkins imports should be together. And so you move the Java imports down below. No. And, no. and I agree. What you did was exactly the right thing in terms of what it would mean to maintain a code base clean and tidy. Unfortunately, the Git plugin has so much history that I intentionally leave it dirty. Okay. And that's a terrible way to say it, but it is intentionally left dirty because I don't want to, I don't want to disrupt things there. S someday I dream that it will be automatically formatted by a program and will all look consistent, but I'm a long ways off from that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, well, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Great. Okay. Let's see. And the other was, oh, oh yes, I was going to ask you. So when I was testing, I saw that 
there were a number of records where the the repository that was being maintained was reported of size zero. Well, if it's of oh, size it's... zero, can't we optimize away and just skip the maintenance? Skip it? Okay. Yeah, we, we, we can do something like that. I can add that to my to do. So, so does does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. It does. Okay. I think there are temp folders, right? In uh, uh, the caches directory. So I think that could be the reason. Why. Right. At, at least there were many of them in my caches. I, I don't know if that's if that's typical for other people, but certainly in mine there were many. And it, it, they seemed almost all of them seem to be zero size. So I don't yeah. know. I, it's probably a bug in the Git plugin or in something that they're not being deleted. But my thought was, hey, if there, if if you've computed the size and the size is zero, then there's no reason to bother iterating yeah. into that into that directory. There will be no work to do. Yeah. Okay, and. Oh, I added one non-null annotation. So Rishab had asked a question in code review, can such and such ever be null? And, and your answer was no, it can never be null. And so I, I, I added the spot bugs non-null annotation that says, all right, this is, we promise it will never be null. Mm -hmm. And okay. now if someone attempts in the future to call that thing with a null pointer, with a, a string that's null, uh, they'll get a spot bugs error. Okay. Thanks, sorry. What was that, Rishab? I just said thanks. <laughs> oh, hey. So I think those were the things that, now I've still got more to do. I apologize, I'm behind schedule on my reviews, but I've, I've got, well, there's a lot going on right now. You've probably decoded that. <laughs> so I think that covered the topics that I had. I still haven't found the place where the, the greater than sign is being inserted into the UI. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure it's there somewhere, but I, I haven't found it yet. I'll keep looking. I, I I've also tried uh, searching for it, but I also didn't find it. I don't know how is that being added into the table. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it's got to be somewhere. I just, you know, it, that's why we do code review. Somehow or other, it's in there. I mean, it's, it's all source code. It's got to be somewhere in there. I just don't know where. Okay, oh, oh, help. Okay, so the, the help text right now is yeah. not very verbose. Do you have time that you can add more verbose help text describing oh. what is the commit graph and graph and what is garbage collection? I can do that from my end, but I I wasn't able to add the help files into the UI. I can make. Oh, I can, oh so. got it. That was the problem. It's that we yeah. don't yet have the question mark icon appearing in the <laughs> UI at all. Okay, yeah. so that's one that needs to be worked on. Okay, and yeah. but we'll have to find a way. That's one I think I may have to just do some wild guessing and, and get lucky. I, I tried doing it yesterday, but I couldn't. I, I, I you know, led to nothing. I don't know why. It, uh, in the I use, I've seen the same implementation in the Git plugin. I've tried using that, but it didn't work. Right. So, yeah. So I'll I'll expand the you know help uh section i'll add more definition to it but adding it into the ui was something i was facing issues with no problem that's that's one to put let me put it on my list i'd love to have your text inserted there but i'm going to put an action item for me at mark wait needs to find the technique to add the help icon to the user interface users will expect to um, receive help to, to view help for the various options, uh, maintenance commands. Good, okay, added. All right. 
I think that covered all the questions I had. Rishabh, do you have other questions? So one question that I have related to the gate client plugin releases, uh, since we're adding new functionality, we don't risk, uh, the, I mean, we do have unit tests, but we don't risk regression, right? I mean, this release will just add a new functionality to the gate client APIs that we have. We're not modifying any existing APIs that we offer in the gate client plugin. That's correct, but we've also got unit tests in the, so the Git client plugin has significant unit tests now, mm -hmm. uh, and the Git plugin, I see several there. I haven't reviewed the Git plugin tests in detail, but I certainly did, um, did quite a bit of looking, in-depth looking at the Git client plugin unit tests. So, so was that what you were asking, Rishab, was about the Git client or about the Git plugin? Git client, Git client plugin. Because that oh, is what okay. we want to release first, right? Yes, it is the one that will release first. And and it, it has, so as far as I could tell anyway, it has automated tests that exercise, I think it exercises almost every branch in the code that's been added. Now it mm -hmm. does not, I had to. I had to give up, and this is kind of embarrassing, actually. And Rishikesh, Rishikesh did a better job than I did. What Rishikesh coded was assertions to check that the maintenance was performed as expected, and and that's mm. a really, really good assertion. That's an excellent assertion. Unfortunately, mm. that assertion is strongly coupled to the specific version of Git we're running. Because yeah. some versions of Git, when you say commit dash graph, create a directory named commit dash graphs. Other versions of Git, when you say the command commit dash graph, create a file named commit dash graph and no commit dash graphs directory. And so the problem was I ended up actually having to step away from assert the specific behavior of the, of the, the maintenance task and instead all it's doing now is asserting that the logged message says, yes, it reached success. So it's doing a flow control check, not mm -hmm. a, not a, did the desired effect actually happen? So, so mm -hmm. when the code asks for a garbage collection, it does not check, did the garbage actually get collected? And so Hushikesh, I apologize for that, but I was so frustrated as I was looking at Git 2.17 on Debian 10 and Git 2.31 on Red Hat 8. And it was, I cannot possibly express all of these conditions. The, the test will be 10 times more complex than the code. Yeah. <laughs> so I gave up and, and just said, fine, I'm, we're going to assert that the message is done so that the flow control happened. And we're going to hope that command line Git does what it's supposed to. Makes sense. So did that answer your question, Rishab? Yes, yes, it did. So I, and I guess I have one more, one more asking for permission, Rishikesh, do you mind if I run the formatter on the, the new code that you, that's been added? I see that I thought I'd run the formatter and I look at it and it, it's, there are some places where obviously I didn't. So I'll do at least one more commit to the Git client plugin. Is that okay with you? It'll just be a white space changes thing. That way, oh. when we're adding this new thing, it will be formatted the way that the contributing guide says it should be. And I don't have to think about getting people submitting later pull requests proposing to reformat it. Yeah, uh, I think I've gone with the guidelines. I'm not uh, uh, like that's what I've done, you know, added into my settings. But yeah, you can do that. That's not an issue. Yeah, yeah. so so what, what it is, is I, I see places where the spacing is just a little off. And I know what NetBeans would do. And so I'll, I'm just going to go ahead and load it into my IDE, format that little section, save it, and we're done. Okay. Good, very good. Oh, oh yes, and I didn't mean to ask you actually, I assumed you're okay that I moved the tests of the Git client plugin out of Git client test into their own dedicated file. 
And, yeah. and that was a, that was pure laziness. I needed to be able to run that thing in my IDE and I didn't want the overhead of all the other tests. That, that's actually very, you know, a clean and efficient. I thought of, I didn't think of it. Uh, I think of, I didn't think of doing it that way. So I added it into that big file which at the end right. of that file, so yeah. Well, and, and and that's you did exactly what I've done in the past very frequently. I need all the infrastructure that's on that thing. Just put it right there. And and from execution, it, it makes sense. But for the diagnostic purposes, it was hard for me. So I I, I just moved it. Good. All right. And I think, yeah, so that... Yeah, I, I think, and now you said that you had added some code for LS remote to the oh, Git that client. Was, yeah, that was just to test whether, you know, it's going to fail or not, ah, you know. Got it. I see. Right. Yeah. In prefetch. I see. Ah, uh, yeah, and yeah. that's, okay, that's it. And that's why the formatting is wrong. Good. Okay. So <laughs> I feel better now. It was you who put it in, not me. I, I feel better. Good. <laughs> so I was just checking whether, you know, uh, what kind of error would be thrown if I run a prefetch. So that, that was. Good. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Now in terms of timeline, so we are, your official end date, is it, is it next Monday or the following Monday? Two weeks. Okay. Is it? No, no, it's this Monday, coming Monday. Okay, all right. So we are in the final week of, um, yeah. of coding. Good, all right. So this, this is the right time for these discussions then. Excellent. Now, John Mark reminded me, you are welcome to continue after the end of this end of the pro, end of the uh, Google Summer of Code. It, that doesn't mean you have to have to go away and leave. But I, I do understand universities starting again. It's summer is over, et cetera. Yeah, I'll, I'll be contributing uh, there, you know, making good. this a better, you know, project. Very good. Oh, oh, one more question. Are you okay if I squash all the commits into a single commit? Yeah, that, that is something we'll have to do. Okay, so you, you, you don't mind that, that the, the history will be, be compressed into a single thing and we'll, we'll just put it right there. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Great. Okay. So uh, I've also fixed the expand button. We weren't, uh, you know, one to ten. Yeah. So that has that has been fixed. Uh, now it's working on all of them. Okay. So that was one thing I worked on. I wrote the Java docs for uh, like. The main things I've written for, I didn't write it for the UI part. Now, if you want, I can add it for that as well. No. Uh, and I didn't write the Java docs for the XML uh, storing thing as well. So I, okay. I thought, yeah, that also can be added. Okay. Uh, other than that, uh, I, I have to add a custom sort for, you know, the table where I was displaying data 1 MB, 2 MB, 3 KB, that has been, that's being sort, that those are all string data types, right? So I'll have to add a custom sort where I can compare which is better, like which is larger and which is smaller. So that has to be done. I think other than that, I think, yeah, we are good to go. Uh, Very good. So so there's no way to present that data in terms of making it just a number. Could you could you simplify your life by converting the string to a number? Oh, but then I wouldn't get the MBKB right. That that. Uh, yeah. So how? so now this is this is me being shameless again. So Rishab can give his opinion. What if you just expressed everything in megabytes and put megabytes on the end? So it was 0 0.01 or 001 megabytes if it was a one k byte file. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, that kind of makes sense. Well, uh, I, I'm open to the string based sort as well. You, you do, you, it's, it's your choice. I was just thinking for me, numeric sorting is very clear 
very obvious. So, uh, we are talking about the repository sizes here, right? Uh, right. Which we display in the table. Okay. Yeah, sorting so isn't. Yeah, sorting pro properly because that's a string data type, right? So. And uh, so, what is the default um, data size that we uh, push there? Is it in KBs? Well, it is in. Oh. He, he's it's smart in that if they're kilobyte size, so if it's less than a megabyte, it shows it as KB. If it's more oh. than a megabyte, it shows it as megabytes. I, I, I didn't attempt anything bigger than megabytes, so I didn't check a terabyte size repository, but but I assume that it would show it as a thousand megabytes. But my thought was, okay, what if we just admitted for purposes of this thing, a megabyte based rendering is good enough. We may, we may even say, and I guess that's another, another for your consideration, Hrushikesh, if, if the repository size is less than a hundred kilobytes, don't bother optimizing it. <laughs> okay. Just, just because there's probably not much in it. And, yeah. and maybe you make it 50 kilobytes, but, but, you know, some, it, it doesn't, super small repositories, even all the optimization in the world isn't going to make them that much faster, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is, there's no amount of optimization can make zero smaller than zero. Zero is still pretty close to zero. Yeah, yeah. that kind of makes sense, yeah. I mean, if, if we knew how much, I mean, what is the kind of operation time that is uh, that is being like that has been um, performed when we are looking at you know a certain size of a repository, then maybe we can find this threshold of where we should set it. Although 100 KB seems and it seems like a reliable number, where less than that would it won't make a difference. Well, but, but I think your point is valid, Rishab. It may be that the number should be 10 megabytes. <laughs> I mean, there's there. if we were to gather real data, the real data might inform us that maintenance operations on a repository of less than 500 kilobytes is a waste of effort. It doesn't help enough to matter. The, the problem with that is, I don't know how we would gather that data. So is it possible for me to go into my Jenkins cache repository and just add, uh, I mean, it has to be a Git. It has to be a Git repository within the cache, right? So yeah. if I am able to, uh, let's say, create 100 more folders of a certain size within that cache, and then I run Rishikesh's code, it would, it would execute on those repositories, right? Or mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, what I'm trying to ask is if I haven't added those repositories via Jenkins, and I've just added something in the cache directories, which are Git repositories, caches, but I've, I've not gone through the Jenkins, so just added those folders within the cache, would it still make the maintenance pattern would run on it, right? It, it yeah. would. In fact, there's a there's a very specific technique that that some some very advanced users have used where they will take a single folder and they will then get fetch into that folder from multiple different repositories. So what they're doing is creating a single folder, which is actually the union of several different repositories. And, and oh. it's, it's, it's valid to do that. It's a little odd, but it's valid to do that. And so the, the, the idea you suggested, what if I go into a Git repository and make it grow by a significant amount. Say I fetch in a copy of the Linux kernel. Well, it mm -hmm. will be now inside there and that thing will now receive the next maintenance cycle. We'll compute the size based on actual disk size and say, there's a lot of work to do here, let's do it. So, I mean, if it's something that is uh, you know, priority to us or would help, then I would like to do this experiment to help education. That's something that we would want for it. And maybe, you know, I could I could create a set data size, I could just create a simple table and then we could see how maintenance 
like what was the previous size and then what is the actual size and what is the operation i mean what is the time that it takes so the uh, the amount of um, optimization in terms of percentage that it has done and the time that is it has taken would then allow us to see if we what would be the size where we would say that okay it is negligent the uh, the optimization is negligent versus the time that we say is you know something that we then would want to set the bar here so that we avoid egg, you know adding more uh, let's say uh, operation time for the maintenance task hmm. yeah i i've i'm not i don't object to it but i fear that I would think that that effort will be an enormous amount of work for you. And I'm hesitant to sign you up for, for that much work. It just feels like there's a lot, a lot that you would be comparing and trying to find this and that. So, so I, I think we, I would love to see the, that kind of data that says, hey, look, here is the cost of a repository that grows this much. And here's the impact on various, various operations but for me, that seems like that's a that's going to be a complicated thing to gather, and and then for you to be be sure you you believe the data that you're it's repeatable, reliable, that that kind yeah. of stuff feels like it'll be complicated for you. Um, yeah, I mean, I I, I guess it, it depends on if it's if it's something that we both need. Um, before I, this is more of a good to have feature, right? Is it, it's not necessary for the plugin. Like we, we are iterating. I mean, I, I could just try try if I if I end up spending more time than I think that I and then I can we can just maybe look at the data. It's not necessary for us to encode any of the results within the code because it's we're almost at the release time. And I, I don't think we should just yeah look at an experiment and maybe encode that within the code. Great. Yeah. If, could just if, we could look at? Hmm. Would love to, I would love to have the results. I think that that could be very interesting. Yeah. And, and fully trust that if you, if you find it's just taking too much time to do the experiment, you are perfectly welcome to say, I'm not going to do this any further. Yeah. Just trust your judgment yeah, when try. you say, Hey, this is too much. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'll, I'll try. Yeah. I'm trying to see how much time it takes. Great. So Hrushikesh, to the to the things that you've got ahead for you, writing more help. Um, then there was, let's see, is that is um, that it? Oh, uh, skip maintenance for zero size repository. Oh, oh right, 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 exactly. Okay. And and that one I like because yeah, I would love to not have entries in the data table that show a size of zero. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what to do with them when the size is zero. Or I'll I'll make it as hundred k before now. Yeah, skip it yeah, now. that's uh, yeah, fifty k. Choose some number. Okay. And the sorting, you know, I'll I think right. I'll I'll do that. Other than that, uh, uh, the blog post I've worked on the blog post. So John Mark Good. was like, uh, you know, you'll ha I have to make a blog post, you know, where I have all the data of like what all have done and so i've worked on that still it's in pending so i think i'll i'll finish it by this week uh do i uh, i was not sure about this so basically i have an architecture diagram and some kind of diagrams where do i upload those do i upload that in the blog post as well or do i create a draft pr and upload it there and close it you know or just a i think if you've if you've got a diagram it would be a good thing to put in the blog post. I, I, okay. I certainly find diagrams make blog posts much more interesting. It helps me think more about it. Why did they put that there? So if, if you've got a diagram like that, by all means, put it in the blog post. Yeah. So I have the same diagram as how it was implemented in the Git plugin. So I think I'll add that. I, and I think that makes, that makes a lot of sense. That seems very good to me. Uh, another uh, small concern I had regarding main, uh, get client maintenance was I was thinking of returning a boolean whenever you know the maintenance has been executed in the get client plugin because there, there is there's no way of me knowing uh, 
uh, what do you tell in the git plugin that the maintenance task has been executed because we are not throwing an exception in the git uh, you know client plugin so i was thinking of just changing that void to a boolean so that you know we'll get information in the git plugin that the maintenance task has been executed that that sounds good to me i mean the the git plugin could well the git plugin if it what you're saying i think is you would like to know that the maintenance task was successful and yeah. then a, a boolean is a perfect way to do it if if all you care about is did the task finish execution then you you could assume that if it reached the next instruction after the call to the maintenance task then it 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 had it had completed but that won't tell you success or failure. So if you want to return a Boolean, yeah, that sounds fine. Yeah, because it, uh, like yesterday I was trying the prefetch command and the prefetch didn't run on a git cache, but it's saying it has been executed. So mm. uh, that's why I thought I'll add a Boolean and you know fix that issue. And that, that makes sense. Mm. And uh, finally, I'll have to update the README page, the README on the Git plugin. I think these are the only tasks I have. Great. Yeah, I was just looking. I've confirmed that the expand works for more than 10 rows. Well done. So exactly as you said. And I've added the uh, time for, uh, you know, the amount of time it executes. I added a MMMDSS and SSS, you know, a zero, 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 colon, zero, zero. In that guy, I don't know if that is a good way of representing it rather than, you know, throwing some random number. Like I was throwing a number one, two, three, four, five. So I thought I'll display it in this way where the first three are the minutes, then the seconds, and then the milliseconds. If you want, we can change this as well. The, so that makes sense to me. Although I was a little surprised, I would, would have expected it to be hours, minutes, seconds, dot, fractions of seconds. And I think you're rendering it, well, let's see. So I see three zeros, colon, two zeros, colon, three digits, colon, two digits, colon, three digits. So is that hours, minutes, seconds, or is it? Uh, it's minutes. Three minutes, so I added three times a minute. So if it overflows the minute thing, it would get added like one twenty minutes. It would oh, be like that. I okay. see. Okay, so this is this is minutes, seconds, fractions of a and second. Yeah, yeah. Or we could go with hours, minutes, seconds as well. But I when I added hours, there are more many zeros because nothing is going to take that many hours. Right. This is not. Yeah. So that's why I changed it to minutes seconds and milliseconds yeah and and i think so long as the heading is updated to to give an indication that this is duration in well okay hmm. what if you just made it duration in minutes oh uh, only minutes or you like you don't want seconds as well well what if it were sections expressed as a fraction of the uh no that may be cheating okay so i was just thinking in order to have a single number if it were just minutes and representing the the fractional part as two significant figures so 5.17 minutes no no i'm wrong that people expect minutes and seconds they really do so, so different angle then. What if, what if you just drop milliseconds entirely, hours, minutes, seconds, because mm -hmm. these these administrators, if they care about milliseconds, mm -hmm. they're focused on the wrong things when it comes to these tasks. Uh, a few, a few maintenance tasks le take less than a second, so that's another problem. <laughs> well, like... and and so in that case, listed as zero col zero zero colon zero zero, and it's sub or or round up to one, you know, round it up to one second. Okay. If it's, if because, it's. Yeah. The comment graph command already, it has been executed and assume if there's no update to the comment graph file. So there, there wouldn't be any update to it. So. Right. And, and so if, for me, it's 
the difference between zero zero colon zero zero and zero zero colon zero one is quite small, right? It's I'm I'm not going to be distracted. It took it took one second. Okay, that's that's fast enough. I don't have to worry about optimizing it. So uh, you're saying we go with uh, minutes and seconds only, right? That's what I do. Rishab, you okay with that idea? I definitely agree. I, we shouldn't overload the user with milliseconds, especially when yeah, we can, as you said, round up for one second. So yeah, we, we should do that. Well, and, and I guess if, if it makes it any easier for Shakesh, if you, if you say always round, round up, if it's, if it's greater than add one second, you know, if it rounded upwards always, even if it's only a 10, only if it's, if it's 10 milliseconds greater than, than a second, round it to the next second, because whatever's easy in terms of getting it presented to the user, the, the, the precise value of it is, is not terribly important though. Yeah. Oh, Mike, you've muted yourself. Oh. It's yeah, looking very good. I was just staring at the at the user interface. So So uh, this is a you uh, I mean um, UI heavy feature. So usually when we release a blog post for the, I mean, as an end result of the project, uh, we try to explain what we've done throughout the project. But um, uh, the way that we can inform the users about and educate them about this new feature is that you're going to add a, you're going to add it to the Git plugins read tool, right? You're going to add a section there. But I was just wondering if since you know there are quite a few elements here, I mean, to what what is the input that is expected from the user? And then you know, within the output, what do you see in the table? What all the, what all those columns means? And I mean, what could be the impact there? We just talk about that. Would, would, would it warrant an, a separate blog just for the feature where you explain the user what, you know, how, how do you use it? And then what are the outcomes? And, and uh, something like that with, with screenshots of the UI. Well, so uh, would that be a blog thing or should we just have him put that in the readme? I mean, uh, why? Blog, I mean, Mark, within the readme, can you, uh, I mean, would you be able to explain that much? Was, I, I was wondering. It's, it's, the, it's the full documentation of the plugin in the readme right now. The thing is, is an embarrassing number of pages long. Hang on just a minute. Let me go find it to be sure. But last I checked, it has a picture for every every one of the configuration screens and yeah it's if i ask to print it it takes 20 pages to print it so so i think there's lots of room for but now the benefit of a blog post is it's a very it's intensely focused on exactly this feature Whereas if it goes in the readme, maybe what it is is make it a blog post and then we copy that into the readme later. Hmm. Yeah, we can link it in the readme as well. Right, yeah, could also do that. Yeah, so I mean, this would not count as a, I mean, since you, you as a deliverable, you might have one blog post for the project and then obviously the code that you're submitting. So it, it may be something that you could do after that if you have the time, not necessary that you, uh, you know, add it within the deliverables that you have. But I believe as a user, if I want to understand what the what this new feature is going to do, where should I, I mean, I, I can go to the readme to, uh, to see to, for the description. But I, I believe the way that, that you give the demo, right, uh, where you actually explain how the whole process works and what do I expect from that table, which contains a lot of information? Then I either I have to go to a, a, a presentation that you have presented uh, within the GSOC area. And I'm not sure if if all the users or a section of users would know about that. I don't know if they would access that or would find it convenient. Right. I think you're right. So shouldn't... We... I think it's valid. It's a valid thing to say, "Hey, let's 
let's consider some way of getting the message out. And maybe it is a separate blog post. And I like that. If Rishikesh, if you're willing, that would be a great way to highlight. Here, here it is. So Rishab, why not make it just part of, if he's got time, part of the of his Google Summer of Code blog post? And, and that's a key thing. Would that be OK? Uh, I I, th I think it would, but I what I was thinking was when when he's writing the final blog post, it would be more from a perspective of what he did, the entire project. So he would be explaining how he went through what were the deliverables, his deliverables. Ah, right. As a user, I would not be. Uh, I may not be. I may be more interested to understand the feature that is there, and that that is what I was thinking. Right, I, I see your point, and and I think you're correct. That you that makes sense. Yeah, because usually, I mean, when we we are working on a GSoft project, I mean, for as some, uh, for an example, when I did my project, it was not something where the user had to uh, explicitly do a lot of things. Right here, what we see is there's a lot of engagement with the feature itself, and um, yeah, I, I believe it would help. Take it as a reference point. Okay. That makes sense. Any any other topics we need to review as we're in this last week before before end of project? Hrushikesh, thank you very much. It's been a treat to be on this project with you. You've done great work. Thank you. Thank you for the support as well. Whenever I had any kind of problems, you know, it was solved very easily. I didn't face any kind of challenges this uh, three months. It was a very wonderful journey and it was really fun working on this project. Well, well th thank you for your contribution to the Jenkins project and users, I'm sure, will thank you as well. The, the one thing which I learned in this project was time management. I never get up at eight in the morning for anything, you know, <laughs> even college. I go one hour late, but I don't attend uh, the class. So this yeah. was one of the biggest challenges uh, I faced in GSOC. So, so thankfully in your professional <laughs> career, if you, if you check with Rishab, he will probably tell you that everyone else in India time shifts to the end of the day. Is that, uh, am I right, Rishab, that it's in order to overlap with people in the US, you'll typically work late. You don't wake up yes. and do early, right? So, yeah. so yes, no worry yes. that this was, this was an oddity. You'll not have to tolerate this in your profession. The, this was just <laughs> Mark Waite trying to fit in his personal schedule. You won't have to deal with this in your profession. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would also want to relay the same sentiment that Mark has. I, it's been a wonderful experience. And I, I was quite surprised. I mean, when I was doing the project, I felt like I, I used to rely much on the mentors. And I felt like you were, when I saw your code, and I, you know, the amount of questions that you asked in the Gators, and I was quite surprised that you know, you've written almost everything by, you know, by yourself. And like the whole UI elements to it. And the, um, and you know, there's this quite, um, relatively complicated uh, things that are going on when you're locking resources and you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're implying concepts there, which are, um, yeah. So I, yeah, I was really impressed by <clears throat> the whole journey that you've been through. Really great work, Mr. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Let's call it done for today. Enjoy the fact that you won't have to get up at this hour of the morning in the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks.